You didn't come in here to hear about the weather. <laughs> you can hear about that on TV. <laughs> the 23rd Psalm. You all realize that this is the uh, well-known shepherd psalm, is what it's called. Psalm 23 and verse number 1. The Lord Jehovah, note carefully, Jehovah is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Father, bless your holy word now, in Jesus' name. You can be seated. This is what you just read is one of the most beautiful pieces of literature, period. Even though it's the Holy Bible, this is beautiful. It's unsurpassed. It has something to say. Look at the continuity of it. Look how clearly it's presented. And it's talking about the Lord and it's talking about David. It's the 23rd Psalm. Now I want you to notice a peculiar thing. I guess you might call it that. Look at the 22nd Psalm. The 22nd Psalm in verse 6, I'm a worm. Verse 7, all they see me laugh me to scorn. Verse 8, he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. What is this? This is the crucifixion. This is the Savior. The 23rd Psalm, verse 1, is the shepherd. He's the shepherd. The 24th Psalm, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's the sovereign. So you've got three Psalms right here that fit each other remarkably. It's almost like somebody knew what they were doing when they wrote this, amen? <laughs> yes, sir, a mind much higher than ours. So this 22nd and 23rd and 24th Psalm, is, it covers a lot of ground. But tonight, I want to read to you from the 23rd Psalm. About 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I don't remember exactly how long, I got a hold of a computer program. It's called Shiloh. I don't know if you've ever heard of that or not, but it was PDF files on a CD-ROM. That was back before we got so, uh, so technical. And on that CD-ROM, it had the name Godfrey Bowen. And he's a man from New, Ze New Zealand. And he is, if I reckon I've ever seen one, an expert on sheep. This man knew sheep. And I read what he had to say, and I preached a message a long time ago about the sheep and about the shepherd. And Godfrey Bowen established or created a new type of way of, of uh, shearing the sheep, and they started a sheep shearing, uh, 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 you know, test throughout the world, and where the, whoever could shear sheep the fastest, uh, and he won. He was the fastest of all of, of anybody in the world. Now, you've got to remember, New Zealand has millions of sheep, unlike East Tennessee. We've got a few here and there. But New Zealand is loaded with sheep. Listen to what this man has to say. This is straight from his book, Why the Shepherd. The instincts of most animals allow them to prevail over distance, drought, food, pestilence, freeze, and great heat without any help from man. But alas, the sheep is not so gifted. Once it has devoured its range, it is unable to seek new grounds but simply wanders aimlessly, eating the stubble and roots until there is only dirt left. Abundant pasture may lie only a few miles away on a higher plain, but a sheep on its own is incapable of sensing it or of finding it. Sheep also cannot tell the difference between nutritious plants and those that are hazardous to their health. The sheep need a shepherd. Let alone, left alone for long, they will surely perish. The shepherd is the key, the answer, the provider of life for the sheep. This is also true in the spiritual realm. Man does not live by bread alone. Each of us is in desperate need of spiritual sustenance, spiritual food, and spiritual water. The good shepherd not only leads us to green pastures, he himself is the bread of life. Do we sense an inner spiritual hunger? 
Where are we obtaining our food? Are we trying to sustain ourselves? Listen carefully. This man has wisdom. Wondrous, wandering aimlessly from weed field to weed field, looking for something and you don't even know what you're looking for. So many attempt to satisfy their hunger from an occasional few minutes feeding from the pulpit or a devotional book or a Christian program. That is not enough. Food and water cannot be stored up for prolonged periods of time. Provision must come day by day. Consider your needs, plan your schedule, and allow the Good Shepherd to be your daily provider. He leads us to green pastures that we may daily eat and spiritually grow thereby. Why the Shepherd? Godfrey Bowen. If you have an opportunity to get the book, just type it to the internet. Type in Godfrey Bowen, B-O-W-E-N. Godfrey is his first name. He's not with us anymore. Obviously, he was a good Christian brother. He's gone on to be with the Lord. But he knew sheep. He knew them. And it would behoove us to understand a few things about sheep because we are the sheep of his pasture. He's our shepherd. And we are, therefore, because of the very nature of what we are, we are completely and totally dependent on him. It's not up to us to find something spiritual. It's not. It's up to him to feed us. He leads us. He doesn't call you to go out and seek out that. He will lead you. But the problem with us is, and all most Christians is, that they use their five senses to try to follow the leading of the Lord. And you're not led of the Lord by your five senses. There's a sixth one if you're born again, and that's the Holy Ghost. When he comes into this world, John chapter number 16, he will guide us into all truth. So when I read what Brother Bowen had to say about sheep, I was, it was quite remarkable because he... Uh, he opens, opened my eye. What do I know about sheep? I don't know anything about them. Never owned sheep, never tended sheep, never been around too many sheep. And from what I've read so far, sheep are pretty dumb. But it also brings up this question. Now think about what I'm about to say to you. Since a sheep cannot survive on its own, it had to have a shepherd, right? So obviously Mr. Darwin's got to miss it somewhere. Think it through. Yeah, think it through. There had to be a shepherd when God made the sheep. What's that mean? Adam was a shepherd. And who was the first shepherd in the Bible who brought skins? It's Abel, exactly. Right off the bat, we have shepherds going all the way back in Scripture. But what he tells us, I'm going to give you just a few of them tonight, are some of the things that can happen to a sheep. I've seen this part where it's a cast sheep. Have you ever seen that? Well, you look and just type it into the internet, type Google it, cast sheep, and you'll be amazed at the YouTube videos you pull up. And it mar I marvel at it. A sheep will just kind of fall over and stick its feet straight up in the air. Stick its feet straight up in the air. And many of them cannot right themselves. Many of them. Now, some can, but many of them cannot. And if they don't right themselves, in other words, get back up on their feet, they're going to starve to death. Now, some of us do the same thing. We've tried our dead level best to keep ourselves spiritual. You know, we've done all the spiritual things. But the truth of the matter is you can go to the Bible, memorize the Bible, and still not let the Bible speak to you. Do you realize the entrance of thy word giveth light and understanding the simple? Do you realize the Bible is a sharp two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, the discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart? The Bible will discern us. If we'll read it, what we're doing is taking life into ourselves. It's important. If you read the Bible, it makes no difference whether you understand all of it or whether you're a dispensary, pre or a post or pre-trib, post-trib, whether, whether you're a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or whatever you are. If you believe the Bible, when you take the Bible into your system, you just receive something that's alive. Amen. Amen. I cannot emphasize that part enough. Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 6 says this, as relate to the cast sheep. For when we were yet without strength, osthenes is the Greek word. It means impotent, no power whatsoever. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's the cast sheep. We can help ourselves. You can't save yourself. You can't even find the way to save yourself. But if you cast yourself on the Lord Jesus, he'll lead you to living waters. Because he is the water. Well, the first thing that I put down that could happen to a sheep is a cast sheep. Then there are the sheep that can be swept away. The shepherd will not take his sheep near fast-moving water. Why? If that sheep carrying all that coat of wool gets caught up in that water, it's going to carry it right away. It's going to be gone, unlike us. 
Uh, you know, when we can stand in water, swim, play, a sheep cannot. It cannot handle fast water. So he leadeth me beside the what? Still waters. It's up to the shepherd to do that. In Galatians chapter number 2 verse 13 in reference to being swept away. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas was a good man, folks. When you read the book of Acts, you'll find out that Barnabas was a good man. And he loved the Lord. But he was not the doctrinal champion that the apostle Paul was. He was more concerned about fitting in with the brethren, you know, not stirring the pot, not going against the flow. And because of that, he got swept up with, with false doctrine, dissimulation. In other words, Judaizers. He got sucked into it. The first time the Apostle Paul was confronted with Judaizers, do you know what he did? He rebuked them to their face and said, you're trying to, he said, you, what you have tried to do is add to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care, I don't care how sincere you are and how wonderful you are in your church. There is no such thing of Christ plus something else. It is Christ plus nothing. He is absolutely and completely total. Totally able to save that which committed to him against, uh, against this world. That's why he says he's able to save to the uttermost. In the Bible says in verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children. Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men, a cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. I've known some Christians that have done everything since they've been saved. <laughs> they've been everywhere. They're looking for this. They're looking. They don't know what they're looking for. They have no idea. Now, I was like that when I first got saved. I was a baby, 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 baby. I had a rattler. I had a pacifier. I ate baby food. But I thought after six months, I'd, I'd conquer, I'd, I knew the Bible. I mean, I was a master. And 12 months, I was an old hand, buddy. Don't try to tell me anything. I knew it all. It only took me a year. Any of you in here today at night, it, it, did it take, is anybody in here that didn't take quite a year for you to master the Bible? Well, let me tell you something right now. I've never met a master of the Bible. You know why? Because there are things in that Bible that are yet to be revealed. And they'll be revealed in due time. Amen. But you can be swept away. Now, whatever, what else happens to a sheep? They wander away. They have a tendency to kind of wander away from the flock. And that's sad. You ever seen Christians do that? Oh, yeah. Well, so-and-so left the church. I wonder what's going on with so-and-so. I guess I would leave too. Have no idea what they're going, where they're going to. No idea. If you change a church, there ought to be a reason for it, right? Most of the time, a doctrinal thing. Or sometimes there may be an issue with morality. Or somebody's fallen. And all kinds of things involved in, in changing churches. But it shouldn't be because, well, oh, so-and-so left. I'm going to follow them. Well, you better not follow so-and-so. You follow the Lord. Note carefully. Follow him. The Bible said in 1 Peter 2, 25, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Hallelujah to God. There's just one shepherd and bishop. There's just one. Matthew 8, 12. How think ye? If a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine? There's a beautiful song over here. The ninety and nine. Does he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? If you're backslidden on God tonight, it's not your place to try to find him. Your place is to listen to him. He'll find you. You may be sitting at a bar crying in your beer. You may be out here somewhere in some hell hole you don't belong in. But the Holy Ghost can come to you where you are just like he came to you when he saved you. You got to get this. He didn't say, hey, you need to be saved. I want you to straighten your act up and now come to God. No, sir. That's religion. He comes to you and says, you're lost and I'm your savior. There is no hope apart from me. If you'll receive me, I'll pull you out of this mess that you're in. Amen. When you see Christ, the only way you can look is up anyway. <laughs> you got to look up to see him. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 8 verse 13, And so he find it, verily I say to you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Can you imagine God rejoicing when a sinner gets right with God and a backslidden Christian gets right with the Lord? Then a sheep can be carried away. Galatians chapter number 2 verse 13 says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise, insomuch that Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. 
Now here's the difference between these. It's a, little, it's a little nuance of a difference, but I want you to notice carefully the difference. In Galatians 2, same passage, it says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. Now notice carefully in Galatians 2.13, carried away. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. What's the difference, preacher? In the first one, he followed the crowd. He followed the crowd. In the second one, he would, could have been false doctrine, could have been a lot of different things, false brethren, and you follow a man. If you ever follow a man, he'll lead you wrong. He'll take you out and he'll drop you in the desert. He'll fail you. That includes me. If you follow a man, rejoice with me in the one we believe in. I believe in him. I love him. Rejoice with me in the fact that we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. Rejoice with me. I'm a bishop, a pastor of a local assembly. And it's my responsibility to feed you. But don't follow me. Follow Christ. Amen. Amen. Then there is the Judas sheep. You ever heard of him? Yeah. Listen to what Godfrey Bowen says. In New Zealand, where over 40 million sheep are sent to the market, the sheep are led to the slaughter by the Judas sheep. The Judas, now listen carefully, the Judas sheep is a big pet, whether a castrated male, which leads the sheep from the bottom pen area up to the ramp to the top killing floor. The poor sheep are totally unaware of what awaits them as they blindly follow on. Once up to the top, the trap door is open for the Judas sheep, and he trots away and back down to the bottom pen area to lead another group of sheep to their destiny. Boy, he's a pet. He's a pet, see? In other words, he's in tight with the opposition. He's in tight with the enemy. Aren't you glad that there will come a time when you have to show your true colors? You do that, don't you? In battle, so many times in the past, they'd have the flag covered. And when they met on the battlefield, they'd uncover the flag and let her fly in the breeze. That's who we are. I've got a flag right there. Amen. See that flag? That's a blessed flag. That represents my church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's my flag. So, 40 million sheep, a Judas sheep. Have you ever been a Judas sheep? Devil ever used you to mess up a bunch of people? Especially young babes in Christ. Especially the young ones. They haven't been saved long. And you want to manipulate them. And you know exactly how to spin things. And they come in starry-eyed. And they haven't been saved long enough to discern that put on religion. Have you ever done that? I hope not. You don't want to do that. Because that would cause me to doubt whether you even know him or not. I have no knowledge of him. So this psalm is one of three. Psalm 22, Christ is seen as the substitute. Psalm 23 is the shepherd. And then Psalm 24 is the sovereign. He deals with the past, present, and future. In the past, we have a cross. In the present, there's a table set. In the present, in the presence of our enemies, a good study is to find out who Israel's enemies were and what they represented as they came out of Egypt. When they went through 40 years in the wilderness, after that they were going to cross the Jordan River and go into the land. Well, before they even got to the river, they had enemies rise up against them. These enemies, every one of them, represent a certain part of how Satan will come against us. Amen. Amalek, of course. What is Amalek? Amalek is a picture of the flesh. And he said, I will war with Amalek forever. There will never come a time that I... Why? Because you will war with your flesh as long as you're in it. Remember, I'm carrying a two, I'm not going to tell you how much I weigh, but I'm, I'm, carrying a, I'm carrying a carcass around. It's not going anywhere, folks. It's going back to the dust from whence it came. But oh, the one inside here, <laughs> I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Bernie Sanders, you know, just had a heart, uh, he had stents put in his heart, his blood flow shut off, he had a... I don't know if he had a heart attack or not, but he had a heart procedure and he was losing his strength and you'd lose it fast. Heart, boy, you lose it fast. 
And then he had, uh, he, uh, they did a couple of stents or whatever, and now his blood flow back, and he's back on the campaign trail. It just shows you how quickly you can go down. Amen. That heart, it means heart. It is the center of your being. So these psalms in the past, present, and future. Here's an interesting study for you tonight. I won't give it out, but I've looked at it, and I've thought, man, that's got to be something. When we talk about the enemies of the, of, the, of the Israel, and they're the same as the enemies of the church, the Lord said, I'm going to put a table in front of them. I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a table out there. And they're going to watch you as you feast. Well, aren't they invited? No, they're not invited. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb. And the house of God's invited. The family of God. See, the family of God is much bigger than the church here tonight. Or the church in this dispensation. The family of God goes all the way back to Adam. Amen. He was in the family of God. Each has its dispensation. This is what's called grace. The one following us is, uh, is, 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 is not soon the dispensation of the millennium. And that will be for a thousand years after seven years of Jacob's trouble. The tribulation leads us into it. So we have here in the 23rd Psalm quite a remarkable thing. And uh, here's what happens. When you look at the 23rd Psalm, it starts out, Jehovah. See that? L-O-R-D. That's printer's type. These King James translators, every time they found the tetragrammaton, that's what it is. yod He vau He. Every time they found that, they translated it as Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Here's why. Because every time that word shows up in the Bible, it reminds them of the covenant-keeping God, where the blood covenant was ordained and established. In plain words, God is saying, I'm coming, coming into a covenant relationship with you. Now, when you have some covenants in the Bible, for example, are, uh, are the kind of covenant where it's a one-sided deal. God makes a covenant, but the other side doesn't have to do anything, agree with it or anything. Do you know one of them he, he gave? A, a, where? The rainbow, exactly. Right after the flood, right after the flood, the Lord bound himself in a covenant that he would never destroy the earth by water again. Okay? Then we have a rainbow show up. You say, preacher, all you got to do is squirt a little water out here when the sun's shining and, there, and you'll see a rainbow. Yeah, but you didn't have that before the flood. There was a canopy covering this earth. And the temperature was moderated all over the earth. And whatever sunshine they got, and they got sunshine, but it was filtered through that canopy. It's not like it is today. Don't make the mistake of thinking that, that uh, uniformitarianism is what Peter talks about. Everything is as it began from the beginning. No, it's not. Things have changed. And this is why before the flood, they could only eat things, before they sinned, they could only eat things grown above the ground. Once they, once they sinned, they had to eat things grown in the ground, the roots. After the flood, when God had passed judgment upon all breathing things, they could eat meat. So their diet continually progressed and continually changed. Somebody said, well, I'm on a diet and I can't eat meat. Well, it's all right. The Lord Jesus said, rise, Peter, slay and eat over there in the book of Acts. I've never killed a cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> never had one jump around. Just didn't do it. I just reached down and got a little cucumber or a carrot or lettuce or a tomato or any of the rest of that. But that meat on your plate came from a living thing. Yes, it did. And I know some folks that don't, they don't, they don't want to eat meat for various reasons. Fine. God bless you. But the Bible says in the last days, there'll be, there'll be doctrines of demons. And one of them is commanding to abstain from meat. Now, the Apostle Paul put it in context. He said, if a brother goes with you and you go downtown to the Agora and you see meat down there, they're selling the meat, but the meat has been offered to idols. See, they offer it to the idol. Then they put it on sale. Now, they can't hang it long because they had no refrigeration. So you either got it then or you didn't get it. And so he said, if a brother is offended, Paul said, by seeing me eat that meat, he said, I will not eat meat. But the apostle Paul made it clear. He said, I'd eat anything that doesn't eat me. He said, that, yeah, he did. He said, that meat that's offered to an idol doesn't mean a thing to me. Because he said, an idol is nothing. Remember this, it's important. The idol in itself is nothing, but it's the spirit attached to it. And let me tell you something about demons. You start talking about them and they come around. Singing to yourselves in songs and spiritual psalms, making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
All of these 150 psalms are 150 psalms. Isn't that something? 150 psalms in the Word of God. If you ever want to know what they sang 3, 000, over 3,000 years ago, just read the, read the psalms. When they, when, you remember, do you remember when they crossed over the Red Sea and they gathered on the bank on the other side? Do you remember when Pharaoh and his army went right into the Red Sea, went right down on the same land, and it was dry when Israel crossed it, but they got down there and their chariot it turned to mud, and they got caught, and they died at the bottom of the Red Sea because the waters came in on them and engulfed them. You know what happened? Israel stood on the banks on the other side of the Jordan River, or Red, Red Sea rather. They stood on the banks of the Red Sea and they sang a song. They did. They sang a song. Now I'm going to cover these few here with you tonight and we'll move through them quickly. These are the Jehovistic Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah is my shepherd. I shall not want. Well, notice carefully what we find in here. The Lord is my shepherd. He maketh that he leadeth me. See that leadeth me in verse number two? That is his banner. We, we, we march under a banner. He leads us. Now, how did he lead the children of Israel in the Old Testament? He led them by fire and by glory, smoke, a pillar of cloud, right? He sure did. He led them that way. Now, it's quite, it's quite a thing when you think about the fact that that smoke and that fire was only for Israel. And it wasn't for anybody else. And if somebody tried to cross it, they couldn't make it. In plainer words, the leading of the Lord Jesus Christ is to his people glory and sight and life. But to the unsaved world, it is a wall that they cannot cross. First place, they don't understand you. They never will understand you. I got this email. I want you to listen carefully to what this woman says. This is one of the most remarkable that I've ever had. She said, I have a testimony where when I was younger, I used to birth control as a way when I had my first abortion. Then after I used abortion as my way to get rid of my pregnancies, when I got to my fifth abortion, something miraculous happened. The process was they lay you down on the table, then they begin to prep me, first with the IV. Second, they lay me down and wait for the anesthetic to work. That day, the anesthetic didn't work. I was forced to lay awake and witness the entire process when all of a sudden, I heard a baby crying. As he or the doctor jabbed it in the back of its head. That did it. I started screaming. It's a baby. He lied to me. They said that it was a fetus. But I didn't know, did not know the fetus was a baby. When they start crying, folks, that's not a blob, is it? Then the room lit up like a bright light. And everybody started crying because we all felt the presence of the Lord in that room. And when I woke up, I jumped off the table and cried and God heard my cry. And then I want no one home when he sent me home with no help. They told me that it wasn't a baby. So Betty, when I get, get, when I got home that night, I fell asleep. I'm going to jump on down here. Now listen to what this woman says. She says, he says they, she says, they closed the door behind me, left me bleeding because they realized what they'd done was wrong. And God convicted them that day. So was he convicted me. I am very happy that I'm a born again Christian. And my God speaks to him who my God spoke to me that day on the date of the table uh, please use this as a testimony. Do you know what happened? The doctors knew there was something in that room. They knew there was something in there bigger than them. So what happened? Well, the girl got right with God. She was convicted that what she was doing was wrong. Abortion number five. Wrong. This is a baby. This is a human being. So she got right with God. And she began to cry. And they stood around and they, apparently what she says, wept too. But you see, they told her to leave. 
They told her to go home, even though she was hemorrhaging. They told her to get out of there. You know why? Because their money, their job, was more important than their soul. On the wall of fire, she saw the side of the wall of fire that gave light and protection from the enemy. But that same wall of fire set the doctor and his crowd on the other side. And they had been separated from her. This is what happens. Once you're born again, you are separate. You're separate. You can work together, you can eat together, and you can do all kinds of things together, but you are not together. The only one that you can ever be together with after you're born again is another born again believer. That's why we have that in common, that we know the Lord Jesus. Jehovah Rapha. No, I want to read this for you. This is beautiful too. This is another one of those passages like the 23rd Psalm. That is Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner from Psalm 23. Listen to this from Numbers 10, verse 34. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, folks, in the midst of pagan darkness. One ray of light, and it was Israel. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth. He says in Psalm 23, verse 3, he restoreth my soul. That may be what you need. You may need your soul restored. I know you've prayed, and I know you're trying, but only God can restore it. Do you know what we have? Do you know what kind of life we live as Christians? We don't live by sight. We don't live by hearing. We don't hear by smelling. We don't live by touch. What do we live by? We live by faith. We put faith in God's promise and His word that He'll never leave us. He's standing right by my side. And if I were to, if I were to fall, He'd be holding me up. Unless He gets ready to carry me out of here, He's never going to leave me nor forsake me. When I say fall, I'm talking about falling spiritually. God's there to help you and hold you up. There's no temptation given you, but such is common to man. God's faithful will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. And will with that temptation make a way of escape. It's not a sin to be tempted. The sin comes when you reach out and act upon that temptation. That's when the sin is committed. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord send peace. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Verse 4, I will fear no evil. Did you know the Bible says that fear bringeth torment? Torment. So what would the opposite of that be? Perfect peace. Perfect peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. I've talked to people who only had a few hours left in the hospital before they left this world. And they look at me and they say, Preacher, I'm ready to go. God has done something. He has given me peace about leaving this world. Folks, there's nothing any better than that. Nothing. Jehovah sit canoe, the Lord our righteousness. This is something else. Verse 3. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Notice he does the leading again. For his name's sake. You do not drive sheep. It won't work. You've got to go out in front of them and they will lead. They will follow the leader. Now what does that mean? That means that every place that you ever put your foot, he's already been there. That's what that means. If you ever go through a trial or tribulation, he's going through that. He's leading you through it. In other words, he touches it before you do. He experiences it before you experience it. Yea, though I walk the valley of the shadow of death. He has gone into death. He has felt the terror of death. He has felt the condemnation of the sin bearer in death. And then he arose from the dead on the third day. Right? And that's where he leads his dear children alone. Victor over death, hell, and the grave. The Lord said this in Matthew 6, 13. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That's another beautiful thing, the Lord's Prayer. It is. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. But note carefully, lead us not into temptation. Where do you want to go? Do you want the truth? You'll know the truth, and truth will make you free. Do you want the truth? 
Most religious people I've ever known in my life do not want the truth. They're satisfied in their comfortable religion. They get a comfortable religion. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. <laughs> You'd be surprised at how many times the name of Jesus is inscribed on the walls of maximum security prisons. And you'd be surprised how many times the name of Jesus is inscribed on the walls of death row. You know why? Sometimes those people have to be broken down to where they're broken down before they are able to come to grips with God. So you believe in jailhouse conversions, preacher? I sure do, just as much as church house conversions. An awful lot of people, all they got is church house conversions. You can be saved in the house, big house, and you can be saved outside of it. There's something about it that touches the heart of people. I was watching this Jerusalem news station a little while ago, I-24. They got a lot of good stuff on there. They showed a clip of a woman who was a violinist in an a, in a, in a opera, and she was singing. Beautiful voice, beautiful voice. But she was pushing a cart with all of her earthly possessions, she was homeless. This is Los Angeles, California. Homeless. And somebody talked to her and said, what happened to you? How did you become homeless? She said, somebody stole my violin. When they stole my violin, I wasn't able to make a living. Apparently she was living on the edge. She said, therefore, I wound up here without a home. Now, folks, all homeless people aren't bums. All kinds of reasons why people become homeless. You need to understand that. All kinds of reasons. A lot of those people out there on the street are victims. Victims. But here's what happened. They started raising money for this woman. They've raised over $70,000. Do you know why they're doing that? Do you know why they're raising? you know why people are giving money to her? You ought to hear her. You ought to see that. It's because by no choice of her own, she fell on hard times. And she worked hard to become what she was. And every one of us tonight, if we have the least bit of a character, will appreciate that in somebody. And if we see them, if we see them knocked down, then we're going to say to ourselves, she doesn't deserve that. We're going to help her. There's a lot of people sleeping under the bridges that deserve to be sleeping under the bridges. But that woman didn't. And it opens the heart of people. That's the way it works. Do you want to live for God? Well, then God will pour out abundant grace upon you that you can't even contain. Or you just want to give him lip service. I'm going to close with these two statements. Blessed indeed are those who say the Lord is my shepherd. How many of you say, say that tonight? He's my shepherd. The ungodly man may call Jesus a shepherd, but he'll never call him his shepherd. Because he'll never appropriate him. I pray I gave you something tonight that will be useful because this is a real world we live in and we never know from day to day where we're going to find ourselves. We never know. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, Preacher, do you go to revival meetings at night? And I said, nope. I said, why? I only get out at night two times a week, Wednesday night and Sunday night. And I'm so tired right now. I'm just breathing. And see, I was tired before I ever got up. You see, I don't run the roads at night unless I absolutely have to. When you get to my age, and the age of some folks are in this house a little older than me, when the sun goes down, you're ready to go down. And when the sun comes up, you get up. I go to bed with the chickens, and I get up with the chickens. If somebody said, I saw the preacher running the roads the other night, and you better think twice about it. If I'm out there running the roads at night, there's a reason for it. Amen. Just thought I'd let you have that little nugget and let you know. How many of you in here feel the same way? You get tired at night. Amen. You all know what I'm talking about. You get tired. And so you don't run at night. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your word and the good uh, attentiveness of the people tonight. It, it was a very good spirit, Lord, and they received what I had to say. But it really it's not what I have to say, Lord. It's the witness of the Holy Spirit to the truth. That's what they received. They received the witness of the Holy Ghost to the truth. 
that is above everything, worth more than any of it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.